morning, everyone, or good afternoon. Uh, thank you for tuning in today. Uh, we are going to be continuing on with Carl Rogers on Becoming a Person. Um, and we're going to start off on page the bottom of page 60, where it talks about objective knowledge. And, you, and we'll continue on maybe to 63 or 64. Let's see how we do. All right. <coughs> objective knowledge. I would like in the first part of this talk to summarize what we know of the conditions which facilitate psychological growth and something of what we know of the process and characteristics of that psychological growth. Let me explain what I mean when I say that I'm going to summarize what we know. I mean that I will limit my statements to those for which we have objective empir empirical evidence. For example, I will talk about the conditions of psychological growth. For each statement, one or more studies could be cited in which it was found that changes occurred in the individual when these conditions were present, which did not occur in situations where these conditions were absent or were present to a much lesser degree. As one investigator st states, we have made progress in identifying the primary change-producing agents which facilitate the alteration of personality and of behavior in the direction of personal development. It should, of course, be added that this knowledge, like all scientific knowledge, is tentative and surely incomplete and is certain to be modified, contradicted in part, and supplemented by the painstaking work of the future. Nevertheless, there is no reason to be apologetic for the small but hard-won knowledge we currently possess. I would like to give this knowledge which we have gained in very briefest fashion in everyday language. It has been found that personal change is facilitated when the psychotherapist is what he is, when in the relationship with his client is, he is genuine and without a front or a facade, openly being the open, openly being the feelings and attitudes which at the moment are flowing in him. We have coined the term congruence to try and describe this condition. By this, we mean that the feelings the therapist is experiencing are available to him, available to his awareness, and he is able to live these feelings, be them, and able to communicate them if appropriate. No one fully achieves this condition, yet the more the therapist is able to listen acceptantly to what is going on within himself, the more he is able to be the complexity of his feelings without fear, the higher the degree of his congruence. To give a commonplace example, each of us senses to give a commonplace example, each of us senses this quality in people in a variety of ways. One of the things in which offends us about the radio and TV commercials is that it is often perfectly evident from the tone of voice that the announcer is putting on, playing a role, saying something he doesn't feel. This is an example of incongruence. On the other hand, each of us knows individuals whom we somehow trust because we sense they are being what they are, that we are dealing with the person himself, not with a polite or professional front. It is this quality of congruence that we sense which research has found to be associated with successful therapy. The more genuine and congruent the therapist in the relationship, the more probability there is change in that personality in the client. In it, there, is, there is that change in personality in the client will occur. Now the second condition. When the therapist is experiencing a warm, positive, and acceptant attitude toward what is the client, this facilitates change. It involves the therapist's genuine willingness for the client to be whatever feeling is going on in him at the moment. Fear, confusion, pain, pride, anger, hatred, love, courage, or awe. It means the therapist cares for the client in a non-possessive way. It means that he prizes the client in a total, rather conditional way. By this, I mean that he does not simply accept the client when he is behaving in certain ways and disapprove of him when he behaves in other ways. It means an outgoing, positive feeling without reservations, without evaluations. The term we have come to use for this is unconditional positive regard. 
Again, research studies show that the more this attitude is experienced by the therapist, the more likelihood that there, there is that therapy, the more likelihood there is that therapy will be successful. The third condition we may call empathic understanding. When the therapist is sensing the feelings and personal meanings which the client is experiencing in the moment, when he can perceive these from inside as they seem to the client, and when he can successfully communicate something of that understanding to his client, then this third condition has been fulfilled. I suspect that each of us has discovered that this kind of understanding is extremely rare. We neither receive it nor offer it with any great frequency. Instead, we offer another type of understanding which is very different. I understand what is wrong with you. I understand what makes you act that way. I too have experienced your trouble and I reacted it very differently. These are the types of understanding which we usually offer and receive, an evaluative understanding from the outside. But when someone understands how it feels and seems to me without wanting to analyze me or judge me, then I can blossom and grow in that climate. And research bears this out, and research bears out this common observation. When the therapist can graf, grasp the moment to moment experiencing which occurs in the inner world of the client as the client sees it and feels it without losing the separateness of his own identity in this empathic process, then change is likely to occur. Studies with a variety of clients show that when these three conditions occur in the therapist and, then, and when they are to some degree perceived by the client, therapeutic movement ensues. The client finds himself painfully but definitely learning and growing and both he and his therapist regard the outcome as successful. It seems from our studies that it, that it is attitudes such as these rather than the therapist's technical knowledge and skill which are primarily responsible for therapeutic change. And I am going to end there because the next, uh, the dynamics of change start a new section. And so I want to just leave it there because this was very powerful to read. So thank you again all so much, and uh, I look forward to uh, being with you again tomorrow.